Well, my name's Joel. I served in the Marine Corps from 99 to 03 in, uh, as an artilleryman. 1st Battalion, 11th Marine Regiment out of Camp Pendleton, California. I remember being home on leave uh, Christmas um, everybody was asking about that potential, would I go, would I not go, what was going to happen. And I would still tell my family and friends, my girlfriend, that you know, nothing's going to come of this. This is just America carrying a big stick. It's not, there's not much here, really. There's no way we could go this one alone. This is too big. But then I got back from leave, and that decision had been made. So we got back, and we basically packed our bags. And most guys flew over. Um, we were one of the last units to arrive in Kuwait. My feeling still was that we wouldn't go this alone, that we would all be staged. And that would be the end of the show of force. That would be the, the oomph in diplomacy to kick, to kick things into real action, real movement, a lot more momentum but it, it wasn't to be. So we spent a couple of weeks in the, the desert in Kuwait, uh, basically just training. That's all we did. It was the same as any desert in, in California. So the weapons of, mass discussion of, me, weapons of mass destruction argument helped me settle into what I was about to be a part of. Uh, and we were all pretty nervous about that. Um, Trusting the gear that we'd been issued, uh, is it going to work? Um, you know, in the gas chamber back on Camp Pendleton is one place. Uh, the, the munitions that would be used on us are going to be much different and much more severe um, than what we train with. So we were all pretty nervous. I think sometimes I shaved my face three times a day just to make sure the seal on the gas mask, I, I could trust that at least. Not necessarily the garments that I was wearing, but at least my gas mask would stay on my face. <laughs> um, you know, we were issued drugs to give one another in case we had to, to help someone through an attack like that. If, we were all, if he was exposed, we could help each other through that. So that was um, definitely weighed heavy on our minds. We came up from Kuwait. We were the eastern flank of the advancing forces. And there was a large division, as I recall, in the southeast of Iraq. And we were in the end to the west of their retreat, their avenues of retreat. And so for four or five days, we ended up in some fairly heavy fighting. Um, mostly it was thought against those retreating forces. And the notion that most folks have about artillery is that they're, they're, they're back from the front. Um, we can shoot 30 miles away. We can shoot from 30 miles, and that's, that's a good ways away when you get right down to it, especially with the a military that has no air power, uh, that has no functioning long-range weaponry. Uh, but we weren't. We moved so quickly um, that we, at times, competed with the infantry for that front-line ground. And being so close to the infantry, I saw a lot of their work and was in a few firefights. Um, saw Iraqis die, um, saw a lot of buses. One of the tactics of what little resistance there was, but one of the tactics of those fighters was to commandeer buses with civilians on them, Iraqi civilians, <coughs> drive at high speed down the roads um, shooting RPGs at the Americans in front of them, thinking that we would not fire upon them because there were civilians on the bus. Uh, 
Well, unfortunately, the rules of engagement are very clear. Uh, that bus is to be destroyed, regardless of whether there's one um, combatant on that bus hiding behind 50 civilians or 50 combatants on that bus. That bus is to be destroyed. And so we would see the, the after effects of, of those engagements. Um, so I saw a lot of dead children, uh, a lot of dead women, dead seniors, um, burned out buses, and it was all very fresh. And then you go through the cities that we had just destroyed, um, that we had just destroyed just a few hours before or the night before, and that was difficult to see, actually. All these homes, marketplaces, storefronts, businesses, just rubble. There was little resistance in the end. When you think about taking over a country, what kind of resistance will there be from an army that was possibly a, a serious threat to us? Uh, it, it, ended up not being. In three and a half weeks, we accomplished the mission. Uh, <laughs> and we know that that's not the case. But we settled into Baghdad and you know, began making security patrols. So things obviously kind of calmed down a little bit for us. But we didn't find the, the weapons. We didn't find the resistance. Um, we found people fairly excited or at least expressing that. Um, that may have been certainly a, just a mask, you know, when, <laughs> when an army is rolling across your front doorstep, what else are you going to do but look happy that they're there? <laughs> Why would you throw a bottle at them? <laughs> you wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't make sense. Um, so a lot of that excitement may simply have been to appease the American invaders, but there were certainly some folks, I remember on one patrol, um, the same day, two, two elderly people, a woman and a man, at different times, unrelated, came up to me and shook my hand. Uh, the woman actually gave me a hug, and I was surprised by that. I didn't think she would be so, so personal. I didn't think she would actually invade my space that way. I had a gun. <laughs> um, but she did, she pressed the gun, and the gun was pressed in between her breasts and my chest. <laughs> I found that, I, I, I noticed that at the time, I thought about that, how odd that was. Um, this heartfelt hug from this woman, yet this loaded M16 in between all of that. That was pretty bizarre. But she thanked me because she said she'd, she hadn't seen her son in 20 years. He was forced into the army and she saw him today. And that morning actually. And then just a little while later an elderly man came up and shook my hand. And he said he heard from his son a few days before that for the first time in 10 years, 15 years. Uh, and so there was, I had some pretty mixed emotions at the time. And there was a small shepherd boy, God, he couldn't have been 12, uh, had a little shepherd's crook, mm -hmm. a flock of maybe 15, 20 goats, mm -hmm. and uh, just a small drainage ditch on the northern side of this field. And we were probably towards the, we were on the southern side of the field, so we might have been 100 yards away from him, just to the south of where he was sitting. And he didn't move, and we were shooting over his head. Um, and he sat there the whole time we occupied this position with his flock, his shepherd's crook, mm -hmm. and his innocent face. I promoted this young woman to, <laughs> this woman, her name was Zeneb. She was a girl, not a woman, but uh, Zeneb, she was probably 10 or 12, something like that. And she'd followed me for a few days, as a matter of fact, on our patrols and one morning she handed me these flowers that she picked and <laughs> she would run by the truck even at night she'd run by it and I was so concerned that I was going to run her over.
So I promoted her to sergeant in her own language amongst all these teenage boys, and they all laughed and walked away. And I gave her one of my um, chevrons off my, the collar of my shirt, and uh, she liked that. I liked that too. That was a nice moment. One of the notions that our command tried to get the Marines to buy on to was that if we could convince the kids that we were good, if we could help them understand our presence and that it was a positive thing, um, that, they, that we weren't evil and that we weren't destroyers and that we were liberators, that when their generation comes to power that we'll start to see the fruits of our labor in their, in their actions. It was a city in chaos. They, folks were trying to put their lives back together and there was no electricity and there was no water. And, um, it was very tense. Uh, it was becoming more dangerous, um, but again, nothing nothing like it is today. I found myself wondering, how is this good for these kids? Yes, their oppressor is gone, but how is this good for these kids and what is going to be done to help secure their future? Uh, I have yet to see all those good works come to fruition. Uh, I, don't, I don't see that that's happening yet. I think there's more for them um, than what they're going through now. And I don't know that, that the best way to have helped that generation was to <laughs> take over their country. I, I, I don't know that. But I still held on to this notion that um, this was still an act of liberation that what we were doing was this violence that we had unleashed upon this nation and this people had a just cause mm -hmm. and it was the liberation of a people um, but I lost that about six months after I got out I was actually watching a film that there's a woman, some footage of a, an Iraqi woman, an old woman, um, and she's crying, and she's angry, and she's sad, and she has no idea what's happened. She does, but she has no idea why. Her, her village is destroyed. It looked like one we certainly could have been through. I mean, they all did, but... She was asking why it had been destroyed, why the bombs fell from the air, and it wasn't planes that destroyed her village. It was artillery. It was obvious. So it could very well have been my battalion that destroyed this woman's village. It could have very well been our guns, our munitions that killed the entirety of her family. And she was asking why. <laughs> and I had no answer for her. It felt like she was speaking directly to me. Um, and I couldn't answer. A lot of guys could have answered. Because you were being oppressed. Because this is the right thing to do in the grand scheme of things. This is, this is the way it's supposed to be and some people have to die. Um, and a lot of guys would feel good about saying that to that woman. It might have been difficult for them to say it to her face, but that's the answer that they would have given and they would have lived with that and felt comfortable telling their children that. I couldn't do that. So that's kind of when I lost the thread of that I was hanging on to, justifying our actions in my own head and heart. Iraq has to be Iraq and it has to be a place 
of Iraqis and by Iraqis and for Iraqis. And right now it has a feel of America. American input, American guidance, American this, American that, and, and it's all this military feel or this It's being led by people who are trained to be violent, whether they be private security guards or American military, and it's not, it's not a place that seems to me to be full of hope. When I look down the road in Iraq, I don't see an end to violence. When I look down the road in Iraq, I see civil war, and I don't want to see that. Um, but I see us training a, a military in preparation for civil war. I think the, the police force, the Iraqi army that we're training, lacks the will to, to see that kind of war through to the end and be victorious. And I wonder why, really. Um, why they lack that will, why they lack that, that drive that every Marine has. They have the will to fight to the death when their president says, go, do it. Uh, because they're Americans. And their American leader said, you're, you're going to do this because your country is calling you to do this the American way. It's bred into us in a way that <coughs> soldiers were training in Iraq, they don't have that background. They don't have generations of of being called that way. Their calling is a different one. Their motivations are different. Their, what they have the will to do is different. And I feel like we're training them to fit a mold that is not Iraqi. That we're trying to shove this, this will to be free in the likeness of democratic American freedom down these people's throats and they don't even want it. It's a very different culture, it's a very different people and somehow we're trying to make them American enforce our, our notions of democracy and our notions of freedom and our notions of liberty and human right um, down the throats of a culture that is inherently different from us, from our culture. And I, I just, I fear that it is truly a losing battle because of that. That because the Iraqi people never found that fire within themselves or have, have, had yet to come to a place where that fire was bursting out of them that they will never, they're not going to get there until we're gone. And, and I, I want to believe that the administration has the best of intentions, even with the best of intentions. Um, we're trying to do something we shouldn't be doing in the end. Freedom and democracy will come to the world. I have faith in that because it, everyone has the right to be who they are, where they are, when they are. And we all know that. We all know that. Um, but it can't be forced the way it's being forced now. And so we're going to lose in Iraq because of that. That's my fear, that we're going to lose there. Uh, I have a hard time believing that we did what we did simply to liberate a nation and spread democracy. I feel in my heart that what was done was done out of revenge and done out of greed. And I don't know that. 
I can't know that, unfortunately. I don't even believe that if I sat down with President Bush and Vice President Cheney and had a beer at a bar with them, that I would come away knowing any more about why they chose to do what they did in the manner they chose to do it than I do now. I believe their ties to the oil industry um, almost <laughs> create a conflict of interest that they should have recused themselves themselves from that decision simply because they stood to make money from a greater stake uh, in the oil business in the Middle East. <laughs> the companies that ended up in Iraq, the administration has ties to those companies that are helping to rebuild Iraq. Again, brings up notions for me of a conflict of interest. Also, knowing the great fear we all have of losing our lifestyle, our standard of living, which is based on fossil fuels, I could see that being a huge motivating factor for an administration. They wouldn't want us to, they wouldn't want to jeopardize the loss of that standard of living. I can understand that. But I also feel that there's this notion of revenge. Um, President Bush's feelings got in the way. What happened to his father? Um, you know, and I'm not privy to the advice his father gave the son in the days leading up to, the months leading up to war with Iraq. You know, this is what I would have done differently. Boy, I wish I could have done this or. You know, I don't know how much of President Bush's decision-making process was, was affected by Bush Sr.'s advice, but I honestly believe that our motives were not the spread of freedom. I believe they were based out of revenge and greed. And seeing how we carried out the war and seeing how we have carried out the reconstruction. Looking at the choices we've made, I don't see how, how there's really any room to honestly believe that we did what we did um, out of the goodness of our democratic hearts. I first thought about military service um, when I was 19, in 1990, when we uh, went to liberate Kuwait. I supported the liberation of Kuwait. I felt that was um, something that we should, have, we should do, and the rest of the world agreed, pretty much. The rest of the world thought that Iraq crossed that line and we drew it. We took the country back and there we go. Um, and so over the course of the next nine, ten years, I went about my life and would think about that sort of stuff on occasion. And I woke up one morning and oddly enough, the screensaver on Microsoft Windows 98 or whatever it was, um, was where do you want to go today? It's what kept scrolling across the screen in big, bold, scarlet letters. And I had this immediate notion of, you want to join the Marine Corps? And that floored me. So I rolled over, I went back to bed, I turned off the computer and forgot about it um, for a couple of hours as I slept. And then I really started thinking about it. You know, where did that come from? Did it come from somewhere? Did you have some funky dream? Um, and I had just bought property in Tennessee. So I owned land in America. I thought this was 
if I was going to live anywhere in the world, this was probably, and raise children anywhere in the world, that in the end, opportunity is greatest here, and there is so much hope in America for so many people. Um, we've been doing this for a long time now, and we've come to a lot of good places in our society. But I decided that I wanted to make this community my home for the rest of my life. And that's where that thought of joining the military came from. Um, responsibility to, to community. And I decided that before I truly settled down, um, that I would serve my community in that capacity because I had the capacity to do so. It was a call. I felt called as a member of the society because I was intelligent enough to understand what I was deciding to do, physically fit enough to handle that. Yeah, it was a call to serve. That's, that's all it was. It's a different type of service, but it was a call to serve. You know, I'm proud of my service, and I'm proud to, to have that bond with the men that I have that bond with in the Marine Corps. And I don't regret serving in the military. I don't regret being a Marine. Um, and I want to honor that. all these men and women are doing things at the behest of their nation and it just needs to be right. When we send our children off to kill, it has to be moral. And I don't know that what we're doing is moral. I don't, I don't know that it's right or just anymore. And it has to be. It has to be.